know. I think we probably, as a, we'll probably talk about it tomorrow on a leadership call, but I think we all need to figure out exactly what the deal is. And I'm sure it's going to be, you know, just to make things more interesting, like, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some county specific stuff. Like right now, I think in Alameda County, technically it's still only two people, at least last I've heard, it's still only two people, but like I think in San Francisco and in Contra Costa, you can do more than two people. So I think we'll need to, I think we should do um, a separate like class to open up for everybody or just training or just mastermind session on open houses where we can also talk about procedures. But I think right now I'll just take, you know, 10 or 15 minutes to just talk about a few like best practices for open houses. So if in the next couple of weeks you do get an opportunity to do them, you've at least like, you know, had some context to things. So, I mean, um, a, a big part of it is like successful open houses, like anything else, a big part of it is preparation. So there's a few little tricks, like, like, like really most things in this business, if you have a system and you have things that you do every single time, whether it's, you know, meeting with a client for the first time or showing properties to a client for the first time, writing an offer. If you have kind of a, a, a three or four things that you just always do every time, um, and do it consistently and it just helps set you up for success because one it they're, they're things that are going to put you in a better position to do a good job but they're also going to just make you more efficient to where you're not you know think, okay i got open house this weekend what do i need to do like there's obviously like the the basic things like knowing the property that you're holding open um a lot of the times too for newer agents you're going to be holding listings that aren't your own so asking, you know, the listing agents will, should be pretty good about giving you a, at least basic info. Obviously, like the, the statistics on the property, like square footage and when it was built and, you know, HOA, if there is one, all that stuff, you can look up yourself. But if there's any specific info, like, oh, the sellers need a rent back or, you know, they're really motivated or whatever, like um, the listing agent should kind of give you anything that's super pertinent, but, you know, at least get in the habit of asking, like, in addition to the stuff that I can just look up, is there anything I should know? So knowing about the property that you're holding open for one is uh, important, but also taking the extra time and really studying the immediate market right around the home you're holding because you're, you're going to end up in conversations you know not just the city like you want to know what's going on in like the city as a whole and the market in general as a whole I mean as a real estate agent you should always be able to at least drop a few nuggets of, of wisdom or at least opinion like insight on what the market's doing at any given moment but in an open house you you like can really want to you want to kind of take that to the next level and get a little more granular with what you are with your market knowledge, because if somebody's looking at that specific home, if you can share some insight about, you know, a home that sold last a couple of weeks ago down the street, that you know maybe they're not going to be able to look up, like, hey, yeah, this one down the street got 15 offers and went four hundred thousand dollars over asking, or like, there's one pending right now, and uh, I heard they only got two offers. Whatever, you get what I'm saying. It's like doing a little bit of research ahead of time. So you can speak really intelligently about what's going on in that immediate market, because the whole goal with the open house, when you're, when you're as an agent, when you're doing open house, even as a listing agent, when you're holding them yourself, it's not really to sell the house, like to find the potential buyer for that house and really sell that house. What, what really open, like 90% of what an open house is, is an opportunity to meet other prospective buyers. Because obviously if somebody's walking into an open house without an agent, there's a chance that they're newer in the buying process and maybe don't have an agent. So if you can get really good at building a rapport with someone kind of on the spot at an open house, then you, you can potentially pick a buyer. So there's some agents that are really, really good at it. And it really just comes down to, you know, the method of how you, you, it's a, it's a weird, it's like speed dating almost to where you're trying to get somebody's information in just a few minutes. Um, so having kind of tricks up your sleeve that will, will kind of make you stand out. And then also keep in mind that like people might be going to four or five open houses throughout the day. And if they've gone to a, a, the first two and the first two agents are really like, hey, are you working with an agent already? Like, can I get your name and phone number? I'd love to send you properties, like blah, blah. They might come into your open house a couple, a couple houses in and be like pretty guarded. So everybody's got a little bit of a different style, but like I'm definitely 
a little bit more like try to build a relationship based on something like maybe someone has cool shoes or whatever like they try to find some kind of connection and and then like move into real estate from there but when you do get a chance to talk to them about real estate like really giving them some insight that that maybe that the other agents might not have or just doing it in a way that makes you stand out will up your chances of of making that connection another thing that i i really like to do um again this is something that's trickier in covid but the, uh, the environment's changing and this is something i learned early on is like look for a another listing that's vacant. like before you go to open house for every open house look for another listing that's vacant but not open that day because somebody that's going to open houses maybe it doesn't have an agent and is just just casually looking at open houses and if there's a listing similar to yours that they couldn't see it's like you can use that you you know you get in a conversation yeah we're really looking at this neighborhood we're just getting started um but this one kind of stood out to us and you could say like hey have you seen that one a couple blocks away that's been on the market for about a week um i don't think it's open today but have you checked it out and you know if it catches their interest you could say like it's not open but i'd be happy to meet you there after this afternoon or we can go see it tomorrow or something like that like that's definitely something like really valuable and a way to really just like kind of hit a home run as far as getting connection because now you have something they want like they're out cruising open houses there's a house similar to the one that they're looking at that they can't see but now you're offering to show it to them like it doesn't always work but it's something that's worked for me in the past so just always knowing what other listings are are right around your open house also too not just for the reason of potentially trying to show them like people expect real estate agents to, like they they think you're going to know like every single house and if you start talking uh to someone about it and and you can talk about other homes that are similar that you've already seen like that just makes you look like more of an expert and um they 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 kind of expect it so if they're asking you like questions about other homes they've seen on the market when they were cruising through Zillow every night and you you have no idea what listing they're talking about and it's you know a quarter mile away from this one you're holding open that does the opposite and makes you look like less of an expert and and just hurts your chances of building that relationship so really knowing the obviously the property that you're holding but also knowing just the homes immediately around it really help um uh, getting even more basic like putting signs out um it's something that you want to have like it, it a plan early like know where you're going to put the signs out um uh, obviously the more signs the better like your your people will come to open like when you when you're sitting when you're taking the time to go sit in an open house you want foot traffic coming in and the, the people will come in off of the signs so the more signs you have out there the better and also somebody that's just coming in off of a sign is the chances are there's someone that's like more casually looking and maybe don't have an agent there's pe- people that are like in the thick of the search and are looking at properties every week and and going and having an agent cuz cuz when there were open houses regularly there were a lot of people that were actively working with agents but just preferred or it was easier to go to open houses rather than go look at that property with an agent and then you know you'd go back with the agent because that way they can kind of go on their own schedule a little bit more and it's just a little more casual but somebody that's just driving by a neighborhood sees the sign and and goes in the open house like that might be someone that's like really early on the search or you know totally on the fence about buying and those are the people that you really want like uh, uh, talking to people that have agents it's still going to give you practice talking about the market and maybe some insight on what you know buyers are thinking and doing in, in that segment of the market but you want to catch those people that don't have an agent yet so putting out a lot of signs um obviously doing it in a logical way um and making the most of where do you put them um as a listing agent too you know this also helps drive traffic but as a listing agent like you want to see people to see your name and you want them to see that you're active so like whenever i had um open houses like sort of near my neighborhood or you know anywhere in like Walnut Creek or near Walnut Creek like if there was a major street um uh, not too far from the listing like maybe far enough to where it didn't really make sense to put a sign out there but if i could just like drive down to the major street put one sign on the major street so it was like at least get people in the general near area so then they catch the rest of the signs it's awesome because like there's a bunch of people 
that I'm driving down the street that maybe have no interest in going to the open house, but are going to see your name. And, you know, like we know, anything real estate related, is, it's all about like staying top of mind. So having an open house sign on a busy street for three or four hours on a Saturday and a Sunday, that can help get you business just down the road. It's just planting a tiny little seed that's a reminder that, that you're a real estate agent. So taking the time to like really maximize the visibility of the open house signs. Um, so talking about preparation, we talked about signs, we talked about knowing the property, we talked about knowing the market around it. Um, and then I just want to talk about like strategy once you're in an open house. And this is something like, we'll, again, we'll do like a mastermind and talk about more. And I, it, it'd be great to get insight from a lot of different people and how they approach open houses, because I think there's going to be a wide range of styles when it comes to how, I don't want to say aggressive, but just how, like, how you handle the conversations with people. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that more when we have like agents on this that can provide, has anyone on this call ever done an open house? Okay, nice. Ronnie, did you just do one? Or no, you had your license before. Um, so yeah. And Kevin, you had your license back in the open house, but any, anybody else? Yes. Oh yeah, Michelle, you've had a I've license. I've attended before. a lot of open houses. Yeah. I've never yeah. held one. Um, do you have anything you want to share just about your approach to when someone walks through the door, what worked for you, the three of you? Uh, so, I mean, I used to, I used to try to be just, um, super, super friendly, right. And, and be set myself up to where you're not blocking them. Right. Sometimes people try to, um, you know, get their name and email address like right away, like be super aggressive from that point. I tried to be, be more friendly and, you know, and like John was mentioning, like find the shoes or the hat or the sports t-shirt they're wearing, like find some connection heck of quick. Um, and then, um, and then, you know, just kind of, you know, here we are, here's what's going on. Please, you know, look around. And, um, and then I, I, I like giving them their space. Um, that's kind of, kind of my thing, like let them enjoy the house and then try to gather them back in the kitchen as they kind of meander around to really, you know, get to know them a little more personally and find out what their, the, what their goals are. That was kind of my, I don't know nice. if it's right or wrong, but that's what I do. No, I mean, and that's the thing is I don't think there are, there is right or wrong. It just depends on how you go about doing it. Uh, Michelle, how about you? Yeah, I'm pretty similar. I don't like to bombard them um, when they come in because like you said, sometimes they are really guarded, especially if they've already been looking at um, open houses that day. So I, I just greet them and you know tell them about the property, ask them if they've been looking long, you know, just small stuff at first, let them go around, check out the house and then pull them back in and whatever room, depending on the house is laid up and try to talk to them some more, find out uh, what their goals are, if they're working with anyone. And, and sometimes I don't have them sign in when they first get there. I just kind of fill them out first. Sometimes I'll ask them at the end if they can go ahead and sign in. I have a tablet that I use and they can just easily put their information in. I right. just yeah. kind of fill the person when they come in and get their vibe. Yeah, and I, I'm the same way. Like, I rarely try to get people to sign in, especially right away. I have heard that, like, having a tablet, like, that the people seem, uh, people are, like, more likely to sign in when yeah. they do it on a tablet. I've heard that a few times. Or, um, people don't like to write anymore. <laughs> yeah, totally. And it's, like, people, it, it, it you could genu genuinely, you know, not be able to read someone's name, phone number or email. Um, and then also sometimes people will just kind of scribble and then you have like no idea. Right. What right. Ron, how about you? Oh, me. Um, so I think that the, I always say greet them with a smile. That's the first thing. And I, I obviously have a background in customer services bartender, so I can e read people easily. So in the beginning, you basically, yeah, this is the house, you introduce all the details of it. And then I just tell them, if you guys have any questions, just feel free to ask, I'll be right here. But you can tell also when someone is lingering for more than 10, 15 minutes. And if it's longer than that, you can already tell that they're envisioning themselves in that property. And then from then, I always try to go back. You know, if someone, let's say they've been in the house for like three or four minutes, 
then I'll ask them if they have any questions. And I don't have any signing book, but I did download the app. There's an app called uh, for open houses. So if they want to sign in, so you can customize it. I'm going to try to look for it and I'll share it with everyone. Uh, right. it just yeah. it might be called openhouse.com or open house that's the name yeah of the there's app. like open customize. home pro like i'm yeah. sure we'll be as they they get up and running i'm sure we'll be seeing lots of, of, of open house kind of talk on slack and just people's instagrams and all that because it's weird i mean they've been gone for a year like i, d I didn't miss them too much um i missed clients being able to go to them um but there's some people that really just make a living off of open houses so uh, it, it really just depends on your approach. And Kevin, like you're saying, like, you don't know if it's right or wrong. Like, I don't think there is a right or wrong. There are, there are people that I think most people are probably the more laid back, build, build some rapport first before they go in. I'm sure there's people that go in right away and require sign in and get name and phone number before people even start cruising the house that like it works for them and they do it in a way that they can convert people into clients. So it really is just finding what, what works for you. And I think in this business in general, the more you can kind of just be authentically like yourself, uh, the more people are going to feel you and want to work with you. So I think that like whatever comes kind of more natural to you, obviously like incorporating things that are going to give you a better chance to get business, but whatever feels more natural, I think is what you're going to be successful with because you're going to come off just as a, as a, as a person that somebody's going to want to communicate with. Um, one question that I like, I, I rarely ask like, do you have an agent? Because one, it's a it's a yes or no question, and if you you know you've ever been training alliances, like yes or no question, it's so easy for them to just say no. What I my like version of um, do you have an agent is I would tell I would like almost assume that like people would do, and I would tell them like especially if they showed a little bit of interest, I'd be like oh there's disclosures available on the MLS, like do you have an agent that can get those for you then that way it's like, you're not just asking them like, do you have an agent? Cause I want to work with you. If not, it's like, there's some information that you can give you more. There's, there's something available. I can give you more information on this property, but you need an agent to get it for you. Like, do you have someone that can get it for you? And I feel like that one, it's harder. Sometimes you ask people, if you just ask them straight up, like, are you working with an agent? Like you can see it in their face that they're just like, oh yeah. Uh, whereas like, when you're asking them, like telling them like, oh, there's, there's reports available online. Like, can someone get it for you? Then they're like, oh, I can't just say, yeah, because I want those reports. So I found that, that that's worked a lot. That's something that my mentor who runs a team that is insanely huge uh, when she does open houses like that, she, she would always use that. So finding questions that work for you that aren't super aggressive, but uh, are like enticing to those people. And then obviously there's just some like safety stuff. Um, again, I think we'll probably get into more detail, like just, you know, and same goes like when you're, when you're touring homes, like don't ever um, be in a spot where you're like cornered, like have, you know, make sure you like know where the exits are like at all times, like be aware of who's in the home. Like if you see like people come in and, um, like you haven't seen him in a while, like just, you know, just be like head on a swivel when you're working an open house, because, you know, it, it's kind of a target in some ways. So we'll, we'll probably talk that, talk about that more, but I think it's just important to point out that you do need to be careful. You need to be careful when you're touring properties and you need to be careful at, at open houses as well. Um, Ronnie said also have to practice blow off questions and how to recover. Um, what do you mean by it, give me give me an example? Of no, book. it's the same way. It's like when this when they say that some of these people don't really have agents, but they'll say they have agents. Oh, so yeah. you basically had to figure out those questions uh, if they throw you that. So how to recover from it and try to bring him back in. But at the same time, I was gonna say there's a lot of creepy people out there, especially for women. So you yeah. have to be make sure that you're careful and you observe your surroundings. So that's why they even tell us like when you're about to close the house make sure you check all the cabinets the closets and all that stuff so totally. especially for women yeah and i think it i noticed before this time it was being it was more and more common that people were working open houses like in tandem like so people were either partnering up or getting a lender like to work at open house with you because lenders are looking for you know it's a good place for a lender to get business too um but really like, you know, even in the nicest of neighborhoods, like I think an open house is always better if you're there with a partner. 
Uh, and lenders was also bringing snacks, cookies, and stuff, and that could yeah, work for you totally. guys. Yeah, totally. We probably I don't know if there's specific guidelines, but probably like not COVID safe to do like. But they, you know, people can do the things that they take and, and you know, they eat, don't eat at the property. But yeah, uh, lenders are usually the best partners too, because if it's two real estate agents and it's like, all right, I mean, obviously if it's someone you're working with, you've got it worked out and you have a relationship with them and you'll find a way to kind of share potential business. But a lender, obviously you can both work a, a good lead. And it's nice to have a lender there too, because if you get... Um, you know, you do get somebody that's really interested and like someone that's been thinking about buying a home and walked in off the street because they saw the sign and is asking a ton of questions because they love the home, like having a lender right there that they can talk to and learn more about like the finance process. Like it's, it, it's like, it, it's kind of like the, the, the like gem and, and the thing, it's something that like doesn't happen often, but once it's happened to you, it like, even if you don't love doing open houses, it, it keeps coming back because you do enough open houses and this has only happened to me once, I think, but you, you will have a situation where you meet someone at that open house, they like that house, write an offer with you and get that house. It's like some real estate, like slam dunk. Um, again, pretty rare, but it's like anything else, it's a numbers game. And if you do enough open houses and you have some good tactics for, for converting people, that's something that can potentially happen. So, um, you know, op open houses are just a really good opportunity for, for new agents. And I, I encourage you as they come up to um, find opportunities. I, I also think that there's going to be a lot of more experienced agents that are basic. I, I mean, to be totally honest, unless it's like in my like immediate, I don't want to say farm because I don't actually have a farm, but in like the neighborhood that I live in that I, I you know, want to work more and more in over the years, unless it's like that, or there's some extenuating circumstance, like I don't plan on ever doing an open house again. So uh, I think there's going to be a lot more opportunities from experienced agents that have, that won't want to go back. So I think that's a good thing for new agents because it, it used to be like, open house opportunities. And I think it will get back to this, um, even if it's a little slower going in the beginning, like open house opportunities are gold. Like you would get in good with, you would want to get in good with listing agents because you would want them to be, you know, when I first met Karina at uh, Climb and Kenny had all these open houses and like, I didn't have a bunch of listings. Like I wanted to be like, I didn't know her that well, but I wanted to be like on Karina's good side because I wanted to be on like the, towards the top of the list that she reached out to when it was time to do an open house because uh you know once listing agents have someone to go to it's like that's who they're going to go to first and then kind of go down the list and, and try to find someone so really really encourage you to um get that experience so you're comfortable doing open houses because it's not just the potential business from the open house i really do think it's just good practice in general as a new agent to be there because you can absorb a lot about the market just from kind of having people pass through having conversations with them it's good practice kind of trying to convert leads like it helps you in a lot of ways so uh, anything i know this is all kind of basic and wide but any, any do you have any questions uh, michan uh, asking about another agent old open house what's your program payment uh, are you talking about as the listing agent? Yes, as the listing I, agent. No, it, it, the, the opportunity to hold the open house is payment enough. Uh, oh, if there, if it's I've never agent, asked one to do it. I've always done my own, but um, I'm ready to have other people do it oh, for yeah, me. Oh, yeah, totally. See, like <laughs> yeah. I said, uh, there's, good, there's a lot of us that are not going to want to go back. Um, and no, pay the, uh, uh, and like Karina, have you, I mean, you've done... Oh. Yeah, I was going to say for for payment, you you know, it's free, but also the that agent gets the leads that come through. They get those buyers that come through. I've seen it where listing agents try to then take those leads that came through after and that's not cool. So either either, you know, if you're paying somebody to be your your employee that day to stand in and, and you're trying to collect the leads, that's one thing. But generally speaking, it's customary for it to be free and a good opportunity for a for the buyer's agent. Yeah, exactly. I, I think it's very rare, except maybe in a J, except unless it's like this home's been on the market for four months and people, it's so it's like, you know, open houses are 
as they get as the, there's not many listings sitting around that long, but a, a brand new listing on market is a much more attractive open house to do than one that's been on the market for three months because like, you know, I've been done open houses where literally two people came in and then you do open houses where you you literally like don't get a break the entire time and can't even talk to everybody that's there because there's just too many people coming through. But to answer your question, um, I don't think you ever need to pay somebody to do an open house unless you were like trying to get them to hand you the leads. Or it's like a last minute you need coverage and you're, you know, it's yeah. like day of and you're like, help. Here's a hundred bucks or something, you know. Yeah, trying to typically, um, typically you'll have people fighting over doing, not, you know, not fighting over, but typically it's not going to be an issue, especially think on a, on, a, on a team like ours and especially with, you know, people spread out. We've got people in, the, in most areas. I don't think you, you, you'll ever really, unless it's absolutely last minute, I think you, you'll always be able to get someone good to hold um, your open house. And then that, I mean, lastly, I think uh, to touch on when you do open houses for other people, being the kind of agent that you, you know, it, it, it's, it's as much as we don't want to do them, we also, it, it's our name on the listing and our client's property that's selling. So we, we need people that are professional and going to be a good reflection of, of the level of service we try to provide. So demonstrating to the agents that um, you're there. So like, obviously the basics like being on time like I think that if you do little things so being on time obviously and then reporting back like oftentimes listing agents are going to want to report to their seller I mean sellers want to know how open houses are going so I think standard standard practice as soon as it, like one keep track of how many groups are coming through and we said we, we refer to it in groups not people so like two groups of two families of five that came through that's you're not going to say like yeah 10 people came to my open house you're going to say two groups came to my open house so keep track of the number of the groups like uh i literally would just in a little notepad or something do little hash marks check marks or whatever to try to keep in mind um or try to keep track of how many people and then report that back so like think of think like report back to the listing agent as if you were the listing agent reporting back to the seller, like not just the number of groups, but like, hey, um, you know, we had 23 people through or 23 groups through overall, the feedback was great uh, that, you know, and if there's something that sticks out, like if everybody was commenting on how, you know, they hated or loved something, or if you just got like feedback that was worthy enough to like pass along, like pass that along too, because that's going to be helpful for, for the listing agent to know. Because if you do an open house for someone and they don't hear from you all day, they're probably not going to want you to do their next one. So I think it's a good habit to check in with them, you know, be ready a few minutes early. Like, I, I, even though I'm guilty of doing it, you never want to be like pulling back up to the house after putting your signs in, running in at one o'clock when it starts to turn on all the lights. Like, you want to be in a good spot. So trying to be like in the house, lights on, everything set up a few minutes before it starts because people are usually early too. So like getting the signs out, getting the property ready and then checking in the listing agent, like, hey, just want to let you know, like everything's ready to go. I'll follow up with you when it's over. And then when it's over, promptly following up with them, having those habits will just increase your chances of, of getting open houses and and being on agents lists of, of people that they're going to call when they need it. Karina, did I, what else can you add to that? I mean, Karina used to coordinate, you know, Kenny would have 10 open houses in a weekend and Karina would do a lot of the coordination. So she's a great insight on this. Yeah. I feel like, like you said, really updating that listing agent um, and being professional. You said be on time. I say be early, uh, do your homework about the neighborhood when it's permissible, maybe door knock the next door neighbors, at least, you know, like kind of around the house and invite them to come through the open house or see if they want, you know, any friends to move into their neighborhood. Um, and yeah, and just always remember that you are a representative, you're a professional person. So while you're putting out those signs, be friendly. And while you're, you know, walking the neighborhood, be, be as friendly as you can. Um, and then just try to be organized <clears throat> and get your open houses and stuff lined up ahead of time so you can do your homework. Read those disclosure packages, ask the listing agent if there's anything that you should be aware of about the house, you know, uh, ways that you should talk about certain features or whatever. Um, yeah, 
that's about it. Awesome. Yeah, that's all super helpful. And one last thing is uh, when you said neighbors, it made me think of it. But sometimes like, especially if it's, you know, a listing that's obviously going to be super popular, um, you know, say the listing agent isn't necessarily, if it's a vacant home and it's a, a listing you think is going to be really attractive, like ask the listing agent if you can hold it open some weird hours. Like, you know, do ask the listing agent if you can hold it open from, from four to six or five to seven, like uh, on a weekday. Um, especially if you're, it's your first couple open houses, be that that's kind of like a low risk, like, okay, I'm going to do, they call them twilight open houses. Like, Hey, can I hold a twilight on Thursday evening for your new listing? Um, I think, uh, in a lot of cases, like th there's no reason to say no to that. It's just more exposure for the listing. Um, so it, it really, that's just another opportunity to get that practice. And, and honestly, if you do an open house and you, you say it's your first one and nobody comes in, like that's still good practice in doing all this prep work, putting the signs out just mentally. So like when you do get better open houses, you're just in a better spot, like mentally to be in a place to like have quality conversations with people. So that's it for open houses. I know we kind of went off topic there, but um, I think that it's something that I want, I want you all to be prepared for because, you know, like we said, there should be a lot of opportunities. Um, Ronnie said, extending your hours compared to everyone else is definitely a plus if you can. Yeah, that's a good point because uh, when people are out there, like one to four is typical. It seemed like in Oakland, like two to four was almost more, became more typical. And San Francisco, what do they do? Is it two to four? Yeah. So it, that's another thing too, is offering to do it like odd hours um, because, you know, more people will will come in like sometimes there'll be a point where like the there's not enough time in the day especially if people are looking in a wide range of places there's not enough time to get to all the open houses so when you have when you're open till five you might catch a few more people than you would have if you you did it and so you know remember when you're you're a new agent like you make the most of of the fact that you have some some extra time um and that's a good, that's a great tip, Ronnie. Uh, cool. Any, any last questions on open houses? I'm sure this is something we'll talk about more as a bigger group, but anything from anybody? Amy, did you have your hand up? I'm sorry. That's oh, it was just saying that answering to your question, has anyone done an open house? That was it. Okay, nice. So when, wait, how long have you been licensed? 20 years. Oh, nice. All right. <laughs> yeah. So you've, you've been around for some open houses. Uh, cool. Well, I, have, I, I was trying to uh, update my signs and I just wanted to see if any, I posted in the general um, Slack channel to see if anybody had their designs already kind of made up to share just so we could get kind of collaborative insight and in what other people's sign, open house signs might look like and blending their brand together. Um, because the one I have is, I'm just using the template that I think everybody else had, but I wanted to get some ideas there. Oh, nice. Yeah, we'll, we'll probably have some stuff coming out on that. And I know, I, I think there are some team signs too, and then there's going to be like name writers. So I think we will have, Karina, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we'll, we, we will have, not a ton, you, you should still have your own, but we will have some the generic team signs. That yeah. Add your we, name them. We, yeah, we still have some, I think we have like 50 or 60 from, the big order before COVID um, and those like some of them are brand new. Um, and then, yeah, you'll be encouraged to get your own individual signs, of course, for your personal branding. But as a new agent, just looking to get some signs, there's some in the Jack Lennon office. And I think there's some at Dewey's Fast House. So. And plan ahead. Like if you're doing, if you don't have your own signs and you know you're doing an open house for someone and they don't, a, a lot of times the listing agent will have you use their signs, but um, you know, don't don't think about signs on a Friday afternoon when you have open houses that weekend because you could be in a total jam. Like I don't, I don't, I came over in September in the middle of COVID. Like I don't have uh, open house signs with fast real estate on them. I just realized that I have a listing coming on this week and open houses that uh, someone else will be doing this weekend. But we got to figure something out for signs. I bet I was thinking that sign the the places that print signs are probably about to be so slammed 
because I think there's a lot of people that, that don't have a signs because they, I got to go like pull my open house signs out of the storage unit because I'd stashed them away because I got sick of looking at them. Yeah, uh, they are. I, I called a couple this weekend and they're like, they're totally slammed and their prices are higher. Um, just like everything else, like milk and water. Um, yeah. But there's a, there's a promo going around it through uh, EXP's partner, Build a Sign, that they're giving, they're giving a pretty good discount. So you might want to look at that email when it comes to your inbox. <clears throat> okay, cool. Yeah, good to know. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. Well, thank you coming, for coming to my TED Talk on, on open houses, completely unscheduled. But hopefully that, uh, you know, was, was some helpful insight. Christine, are you excited to do open houses? I'm so stoked. I'm like so ready. I'm going to do every single open house. I'm just ready. I have all these crazy ideas too, but I don't know what's allowed and what's not allowed. So I'm just, I'm, I'm going to wait till information yeah, gets rolled out. I think that's going to be, I think a lot of people don't know what's allowed and what's not allowed. And I wonder like if so broker tours are like weekday, and, you know, if open houses are allowed, then people will probably start doing broker tours again. And as much as I don't, didn't miss open houses, I actually missed broker's tour a lot because it was just a good, like I would go and look at every home in my neighborhood because people talk to me like I see every single house. So I actually would make it a point to like see every house in my neighborhood. So when people talked about it, I could throw out something like, oh yeah, that's a super nice, whatever. Um, but that was without broker's tour, I'm like it's not really staying on top of the inventory as much. Question, broker's tour, how do you find out about them? Well, it used to be there, there, and I'm sure this will come back, but there will be like, it's, it's actually in the MLS, like you put it on as broker's tour. And then there are different organizations that would like pull the sheets every week. Where are you again? Are you in Contra Costa? Yeah, I live in Castro Valley, but I really want to work like Santa Ramon, Danville, Walnut Creek area. Yeah. So like Danville, there's, there's, there, so broker's tour was usually in conjunction with the marketing meetings. So like, for example, in Contra Costa, Every Tuesday, there would be this CCAR and it would be a big group of realtors that would meet every Tuesday morning. And there would just be different discussion topics and sponsors would talk, whatever. And it would be like eight to eight, you know, nine to 10 or I, I don't even remember. I've gone so many times that I have no idea, it was so long ago. And then after that, everybody, they'd hand out broker tour sheets that they'd print from the MLS. And then after that, everybody would go out on tour because um, it was usually 10 to noon was was brokers mm. uh yeah danville is thursday so rma and i'm sure all these broke all, all these meetings um <clears throat> moved over to zoom so i'm sure that you could you know hop in one of those like so danville's i think is called rma um you could start i would start popping into those meetings and, and they're probably talking about bringing How? back um it's on zoom i i, I will we'll find a link and some, send it to you because i'm not licensed yet am i allowed to do that um I, yeah i don't see why not but especially yes, you're just please. popping into a, popping into a zoom but i would just get in the habit of going and for all of you new agents um going to the marketing meetings it's obviously like less exciting on zoom but going to the marketing meetings is uh is helpful as a new agent mm -hmm. because you hear people talking about their market especially locally um you hear people talking about the market, you, you hear people talking about like trends that they might be seeing or struggles they might be having. So it's a good place to just absorb information because like I was saying earlier, people, you wanna be really good about talking about the market in general, especially locally. So the more that you immerse yourself in settings where people or professionals are discussing the market and what's going on day to day and week to week, you can just pick something up and then like, drop it later in a conversation, you know, and then you look like an expert because you like, oh, actually this happened last week, blah, blah, or whatever, they, you know. So just immerse yourself in it so you can really just share that information when you have the opportunity. Kevin just dropped um, the Zoom info and the website for RMA. Thanks, Kevin. Um, okay, cool. All right, so back to working with buyers and where we were at. Um, when we left off, uh, last week, we were talking about, you, you, we've been talking about touring and then we talked about writing an offer. Um, your client found a place they wanted an offer and we were talking about like building rapport with a listing agent. And I think we kind of got that covered and really just the main message I was trying to get across is from the minute you're showing the property from when you're calling and asking questions, like you want to establish with that listing agent that you are somebody that they want to work with. So the, the way that you communicate with them 
and and how you put yourself out there you want to be professional and organized and friendly because that's just going to help it ultimately it's going to come down to the best offer and the best terms but a lot of times especially in this market it can be really close and you know the relationship and the rapport you've built with them can can really be the difference i feel like that's really been a difference for me in some of the recent offers that i've won where instead of like, hey, we were gonna multiple count of these top three offers, but if your client can do this, like we wanna work with you. Um, so I've, I've really been like, you know, I've, I've taken pride in my communication with listing agents lately because I feel like I've gotten a few of those calls where it's like, hey, if we can if we can make it work with you, let's let's just do this. You're not the best, but let's, if you can make it the best, like, let's go. So um, I do wanna dive into the contracts and forms part of it. So I'm gonna pull up my screen. I think what I'm gonna do in the, for the 25 minutes we have is just kind of do an intro to zip forms and uh, the basic forms that go along with an offer and, and how you, you set it up. Um, I've said it a couple of times, but we're not gonna go super deep into the RPA on any of these training sessions. There's a great video. Yeah, I, I think it's great, I guess, of me talking about the RPA from last time where we go through line by line I think uh, you definitely should check that out um, if you if you're new to writing offers because there's it's ten pages and there's a ton of stuff in there and you know sometimes you can get clients that are just you know these are the main things fill it out for me tell me where to sign sometimes you're gonna get clients that are like well can you explain section seventeen b six for me and then like you know if if you have no idea what that part is like people be prepared even though you're not gonna have to do it very often be prepared to be able to speak to the entire contents of that RPA. I mean, you're, it's, it's a 10 page legal document that your clients are signing that's gonna bind them to spending hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. You should know it inside and out. So refer to that video. I, I would take the hour to watch it um, and the breakdown. There's obviously other great resources that are explaining it. That being said, um, there's another one coming in December, I believe it was supposed to come out last year, but they delayed it. Tutorials and CAR is also good. There's great tutorials in CAR. I actually like basically just had that the tutorial in the back end. Like there's, you can go, it's like interactive, and you can click on um, parts of the contract, and a little explainer bubbles will pop up. Um, I'll try to find the link too. But there's also a, a, a RPA explainer that you can send to your clients. Um, some people have that like in their high notes or their buyer presentations, then that way it's like, I'm going to take you through this, but also here's this great resource. So you're, you're really like giving them information to, for those people that do want to like break down, um, the RPA line by line, you can send them the like CAR RPA explainer. And it's meant to be like client facing. It's meant for that exact purpose for you to send to your clients to break down the RPA. Um, so let's see. So I, I think I want to just go talk about the forms like as a whole. Um, so here's the forms. It's broken down into it, like folders for transactions. Um, you want to just have, you know, best practices and standards to keep this all organized um there's a transaction for every property so for like every offer every listing um you create a folder in i'm going to go through this kind of fast and then one of the other sessions we can go through a little more detail um so new purchaser offer we're going to do that we can create templates um we'll we'll do other things and i'm sure there's some videos too that that karina has where she talks about templates um, or there's also a great, great video. I mean, I've had people that have never written an offer before and I, I, I should bring this up because it's something that you should definitely watch is Karina's video on um, in the training and events. Karina, Rebecca, if you get a chance to drop a link to that um, in Slack, I've had people that have never written offers before fill out their first offer following along on that video. And as long as you like take your time and pay attention to that video, it's like, People that have never written offers have sent me their first draft offer and it's like 95% accurate just from following along on that video. So that's a, a great resource that Karina has for you. Um, but just to test it out here, 
MLS Connect, um, what this does here, you put in the MLS number and it will pull the property up and you can import some of the information there. So rather than copying and transcribing like the, the property address and the listing agents like brokerage information and stuff like that from the MLS, you can, you can import that using MLS Connect. So I definitely do that every single time. You'll get the APN number from it. It's just, it's, it's more efficient and it's more accurate than you just like going back and forth and filling it in off of the MLS. But I'm just for the purpose of this and um, skipping to that. So what I wanted to do is get into uh, the documents that go into the RPA because there's the RPA, which is a 10 page document. That's the actual contract. So when people talk about like the contract and the forms, they're talking about the RPA, it's 10 pages. But in zip forms, the RPA is bundled with a bunch of other documents. And it's really nice that zip forms does this. Like when I first started, zip forms didn't do this. So I had a little checklist of like, okay, I need the AD and the PRBS and, and a couple other forms that I would need to pull into my zip forms. But a few years ago, the, all the forms that you would pretty much always submit with an RPA, zip forms just incorporated them all. So they're, they're technically each different files. So like you see, this is page one of two, and then this is, you know, page one of two, but these are all, when you pull an RPA, it pulls in all these. So um, we'll just kind of go through this, do an overview real quick. Uh, this is disclosure regarding real estate agency relationship. With all of these forms, as much as you can look at them and it can be kind of intimidating and they look like detailed and complicated, if you really just take the time to like, it sounds silly, but if you take the time to read the forms and I feel like it makes a difference too, if you kind of read them out loud to yourself, like they're all pretty self-explanatory. And this goes for like even, you know, the seller in possession form or, or more complicated forms that you use throughout the course of a transaction. If you take the time to just read them it's easier to understand than, you know, some of the forms can be pretty daunting, but like, I encourage you all, again, you're, you're going to be having clients sign these and legally binding themselves to these forms. You should all at some point read through these forms. So this form, the AD, Disclosure Regarding Buyer's Real Estate Agency Relationship, this is the form that creates and kind of explains the, the agency relationship that's created um, for the course of that transaction. So we mentioned before that like when somebody is in contract, when, when, you, when you put someone in contract to buy a, a property with you representing as a selling agent, like you, you have an agency relationship. This is a form that talks about, right? Some the different responsibilities, who's representing who, and just the key foundations, you know, uh, diligent exercise of reasonable skill and care and performance of the agent duties, a duty of honest and fair dealing in good faith. So read this form because this, you shouldn't know what your agency responsibilities are um, to your clients in a transaction. Christina. Okay. Stupid question. This is on my test. Is this the form that you would give to somebody if they're, you're, you're transitioning them from a customer to a client? Yes, I, and, and okay. it, um, the one thing with this form is it's specific to this transaction. So if they sign this form mm -hmm. and the offer doesn't get, any accept, doesn't get accepted, you don't have on paper an agency relationship with that person because this form is specific to that transaction. But yes, this, this is, is for- This is just for, for a property, that, but that isn't there a form just like this though? That's just saying like you and I are working together. Yeah, that's a buyer broker's agreement. I think we've talked about that in trainings before. That's like it, it, it I don't think it actually creates like an agency relationship, but there is like a, a certain commitments on each side that it does. This is the one that actually like creates an agency relationship. So, so read this and it'll help you understand just what, what that exactly means. Uh, fair housing and discrimination advisory form. I think that's this is pretty self-explanatory. This is actually a, a pretty new form. It came out about a year ago, uh, less than a year ago, actually. Um, I think the title itself is is pretty self-explanatory. Tania, did you have a question? And I got your name right this week. You did. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, about the um, 
I'm not sure if I got the abbreviation right, the AD or the DA. Now, I understood, I haven't done it in a couple of years now, but I understood that that form, to, before you can actually even discuss real estate, your potential buyer was supposed to sign that. That I'm not sure that, that me, uh, Karina. I think that, yeah, that was like kind of the old school way of doing things. Like as soon as you have that initial conversation with, and they become, you know, your client or you think they're going to become your client, yeah. you should have them fill out the agency disclosure, but it's become less, you know, less prevalent now. We just do it with the offer, but okay. I do, I do remember, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, it's from, I, it's from the first quote unquote meaningful conversation is when you're yeah that there's that. we were told that you don't discuss yeah. real estate with someone until they actually sign the form so it's yeah. not that big a deal anymore yes it's, okay. it's less it's less common and it's still something good and it, ideally if you had a buyer's consultation with somebody you know it'd be a good idea to get this signed off you know pretty quickly after that but Again, in practice, it's it's not actually happening. So, <laughs> but I, I have to hop off now, guys. I'm gonna get on my noon huddle. But um, enjoy the rest of of your class. Thanks. Thanks, Karina. Okay, so the Fair Housing and Discrimination Advisory, pretty self-explanatory. Basically, equal housing for all. Uh, laws prohibit discrimination against identified protected classes. Um, that you know, just just talks about that stuff in more detail. Uh, a, a lot of this stuff should be common sense. Uh, unfortunately, it's not, and there has to be two page documents about how you shouldn't be discriminating based on most things, anything really. But um, this just really kind of spells it out. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of uh, more like formalization of stuff and that's why we're not really supposed to write letters with offers anymore because you know it could reveal that someone's part of a protected class or somebody could say like you know they were discriminated on based on information that they included in that letter or or vice versa um but this is this was added recently and just you know makes it black and white even more clear that you know there shouldn't be discrimination in housing possible representation of more than one buyer seller disclosure and consent this is basically explaining um, that the real estate, so, so who's ultimately representing someone in transaction is the broker. You're the agent, you're their agent and you work under that broker, but ultimately like at the end of the day, it's their broker that, that is responsible for the transaction. And so this is basically saying that uh, brokers are gonna be re potentially representing more than one person that's involved. like there might be other people that are represented by your same broker that are writing offers on the property or the broker of the listing agent even though you you could have never met the listing agent before um be in completely different offices if you're both exp agents or you're both keller williams agents like you could have the same broker and so that's just explaining that um there's potential that you know the same broker is going to represent multiple people that could potentially be involved in the transaction. Wire fraud and electronics funds transfer advisory. This is super important when you get into contract with somebody to point out. Obviously this form explains it, but this is a form that people are probably just gonna like breeze through. But wire fraud is like rampant in real estate transactions. And over the last couple of years has just gotten even crazier. Um, I worked in title for a little while. Title is obviously title and escrow is where they're sending money to and from. So a few years ago, this was a really big deal in title because people were starting to get hit, but agents didn't really take it as seriously. Um, but once agents started getting like their clients, so once somebody knew somebody that was actually caught up in in someone that gotten hit by a, a, a wire fraudster, then people started taking it more seriously. But basically, like. This form explains it. I think you should read it because it will help you explain it to your clients. But the main message to get across to your clients is that wire fraud is really rampant. In they, they specifically target people in real estate transactions. And what, what I like to kind of explain to people is, is it's not like the ham of Prince in Saudi Arabia. And if you open a bank account for me, uh, I'll transfer you $10,000. Or it's not like obvious fraud. They, they know it's timed really well they'll take accounts and like 
they'll, they'll steal an escrow officer's email signature and copy and paste it and make an email address that looks like it's coming from the escrow officer. And they'll say like, oh, actually, you know, your wire instructions, like right after the buyer gets wire instructions, then they'll send instructions that are like fraudulent. Like, actually, we're having an issue with the account. Use these instructions. And the, the whole point is to try and get people to wire money into their accounts. So uh, just getting clients to know that like, they need to be really careful when they're wiring money. They're only gonna do it if they're sending their EMD through wire and then also when they're sending their funds to close. And I, I, again, because I, I was a little bit closer to it for a while, like half the time when I explain it, I scare my clients enough to where if it's not wildly inconvenient for them, they just end up doing cashier's checks instead um, than, than sending a wire. But it, it's your responsibility to warn people that they need to be really careful when wiring money in a real estate transaction. So here's RPA. Uh, um, I'm kind of going to gloss through this because there's lots of resources on it for you. It's obviously the most important part of this whole thing and there's a lot to it, but um, you know, the first page is all the finance terms. Uh, a lot of this stuff is kind of generic in stock. Like, so you can see here that I have certain things kind of pre-filled because it's, it's almost the same every time, but you know, how you're going to do the contingencies is in here, the certain terms. So really like once you've done this a few times, like you can fill out an offer like an RPA in, in literally three minutes. You, you put in the price and the, the contingencies. And if there's anything special, you add that and you throw it, you throw it in there and, and it's, it's really quick. Even though it's a 10 page document with a lot packed in there, majority of it is, is boilerplate generic stuff. And there's only a handful of things that you need to change. So um filling all of this out i do even though we're, there's other resources i'm pointing you towards the rpa i want to talk about page eight here and these two clauses technically these two sections the uh, liquidated damages and the arbitration of disputes technically these two sections are optional it's really difficult if not impossible to get an offer accepted without a client signing these like when you send it through docusign and have somebody sign these it actually um, makes these sections optional signatures. I just tell my clients, hey, there's these clauses that are technically optional. You're not gonna get your offer accepted without it. So I'm gonna make them required, but I'm just making sure you agree to it. Liquidated damages is the part of the contract that gives the deposit teeth. Like basically if the buyer doesn't sign the, li the liquidated damages, then they're not necessarily like, they're putting a deposit in, but they, the seller can't, keep the deposit if there's damages because they didn't sign this. So that's why someone's not going to take a contract if it doesn't have this sign. And then the arbitration of disputes is basically saying that uh, the buyer and the seller agree to participate in arbitration. If something were to go completely sideways, if someone were to breach contract or if there was some big issue, before everybody starts suing everybody, um, or even when people are suing everyone, in addition to that, they at least need to try to go through arbitration. Like, I've been doing this for coming up on eight years or seven or over seven years. And I just had my first clients that had to go to, through arbitration. Um, it was no fault of mine. It was like seller non-disclosure. And it was because of this, you know, that they probably would have done arbitration and mediation anyway, but they're bound to at least try arbitration before they go to court because of this section. So signing these two and explaining these two is important because technically they're optional. So you, you definitely want to understand them and be able to explain them. I mean, they're, I think like the only paragraphs in the 10 page form that are in the entire paragraphs in bold, and this is in all caps. So they're, they're going to stick out. So you need to explain it. Buyer's inspection advisory. Um, this is a form in addition with the buyer's inspection waiver that's become pretty important these days because people are so, you know, swayed and pressured to remove inspection contingencies. Um, this is exactly what it sounds like. It's advising them um, that they should do inspections and do their due diligence. You can read through it, but um, you know it's it's basically talking about the importance of investigations. The buyer inspection waiver is is a separate document, um, but it talks about the it's like a list of inspections and basically they're when they sign it, they're acknowledging that they're choosing not to get them radon inspection and and whatever else so again these are, are have become more important because um 
you want people to understand the importance of inspections, especially in a market where they're, they're waiving their rights to do it or doing it more minimally. California Consumer Privacy Act advisory, pretty self-explanatory. It's talking about the, you know, the, the privacy that they're entitled to and what they're not entitled to um, in a real estate transaction. This is a pretty new form also. Um, I guess it's a couple years old. So these are all the forms that are included with the RPA. And uh, this is what you're gonna send with an offer. So I think that it's uh, important that you understand all of them. Again, there's great resources out there for the RPA um, and go through that. The, and, and when you're writing your first offer, if you haven't written one yet, like do Karina's. We're gonna be doing a practice offer um, for new agents that haven't done a transaction at the end of all this training, where we're gonna like, I'm gonna give you a property and gonna have you like do comps and disclosures and, and like actually fill one of these out and submit it. And then we can go through and um, we can go through and I'll, I'll point out any major mistakes or just mistakes in general or things you did well. Um, I know that sounds, can be a little daunting if you've never done it, but really if you watch the video, it'll at least, you'll know what, what you need to fill out and um, what's important and what is just generic stuff that's kind of left alone. Because some of these are like, you, you only check in, in really specific circumstances. Um, but a lot of this stuff is, it, you know, this is where you put the inspection contingency. So when you talk about five or 10 days or whatever, it's, you just fill this out. So it's a, it's an intimidating form um, because of the, you know, how important it is to the transaction and um, everything that's in there. But really once you're comfortable with it, like you can fill these things out, like while you're driving, like, obviously you're not going to do that. I'm joking, but like, you, 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 it's it's easy to fill out an offer once you understand it and you know what you're putting in there because there's only a handful of terms. So that's just an overview of the documents that go along with the RPA. Um, just wanted to show you zip forms a little bit if you hadn't seen it already. There's a lot of cool little things you can do in zip forms to like make your workflow a little more streamlined. Like parties is, is people you can put in here. So, you know, these days when you're, sometimes writing four or five or six or 10 offers for people, um, you, you add them into this address book. So like when you're writing the next offer with them, instead of filling this all out, you can just click that they're the buyer on this form and put it in and it'll save their email and it'll also put it on, on, on any form. The nice thing about zip forms is any fields where the fields appear, appear on multiple forms across the transaction, if they're all in the same folder, anywhere where it says address or anywhere that's buyer one or buyer two, once you fill it out, it, it fills it out on every form. So like once you've put the buyer's name on the RPA, um, you, you pull in another form and it already has the, uh, the, the buyer's information on there. So um, it's, it's super like efficient to use. You connect it to your DocuSign. It's got a lot of stuff in there. Um, and you know, you, you're gonna spend a lot of time in zip forms when you're writing offers and, and throughout the transaction. So just finding little ways to make it work for you um, is just gonna save you time down the road when you're writing, you know, there's gonna be times we're writing multiple offers in, in a day for a couple different clients. So you wanna just have this system down so you're, you're not wasting time. Uh, any questions or anyone? have anything for me? Oh, Karina put the link in the tutorial uh, for the RPA, so super helpful. I wish I, I could be, I could be busier, Ronnie. I was like, I was so busy a couple months ago, or like a month ago, I had like the busiest few months of like my entire real estate career. And then since then, like it was probably like a 12 week stretch where it was like the most I've ever worked. And then after that, like just having normal amount of stuff to do, feels like I have like all this free time because I'm not working 12 hour days nonstop. So it's crazy business that we're, we're all in. Uh, but Ronnie, I know you're pretty busy too. And, and everybody on this team, they're just waiting for your checks to come through. Uh, all right, anyone have any questions or comments or anything? Not yet. Once I'm licensed, I'll have a million for you. 
Nice. Well, we're ready, we're ready when you are. Oh, your test is coming up, right? A couple more weeks? God, yes, two weeks. I'm so nervous. You, you I'm studying it. like a crazy person. Just keep keep taking those practice tests. We've all been there. Uh, <sighs> keep studying, keep taking it. Really, I can't emphasize enough how taking just tons of practice tests, that's the best way, in my opinion, to study. Yeah, do those practice tests. They're very important. And a lot of times when I took the test, just read the questions properly because it eliminates two of the other uh, two of the other answers. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it makes it easy for you. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that, and that's what I said. That's what I always tell is like, re especially because I'm someone, especially multiple choice. Like, I'll read the question and see an answer. As I'm reading the question, I see an answer that I think is right, and it's like, oh, obviously it's this. But the, they they've done a really good job at crafting the questions in a way to where if you're not taking your time and reading the questions and reading all of the answers, like read, like get in the habit of reading all the answers before you answer. Even if you think A is right, read B, C, and D because B might be like more right than A. Right. So it's, right. it's tricky, but you got it. And, and you know, once you get through the test, like you can just forget 95% of what you, what you learned. Ugh. In, in so over this you have no yeah. idea <laughs> you got it and i think you're on the right team for for you know hitting the ground running um i'm excited but, i'm so excited yeah no we're, we're all excited for you any anyone else got anything to say thank you guys for your time and for hanging out on a monday um there is no training on thursday i'll, I'll put it out someone want to say something um there's no training this Thursday. I we have the uh, Kenny. The, the team is sponsoring the the Asian Real Estate Association um, Solano County like golf tournament, and so a bunch of us are going to be down there for most of the day. So we will uh, we will not. I won't be doing training. I'll be playing golf out there. And and for anyone that wants to come hang out, um, Kenny and Elias and a few other agents are just going to be like posted up uh, at a tent at one of the holes and golf tournaments are actually like, it sounds like serious, like a golf tournament, but it's, it's kind of just a big party. Uh, hell of fun. It's a big party. Uh, yeah. It really is a big party. <laughs> Good times. Uh, so it's probably just going to be like a bucket, bucket of white claws and Kenny and Elias and other people hanging out. And it's for, you know, probably from like 10 to, to two, three ish. So it's in Vallejo at a course called Hiddenbrook, but uh, there'll probably be details in Slack, but feel free to, to come by and hang what out. What about the flex the call? Team. Um, all, all of, the, I don't know if they plan on doing them from, we'll probably put it out in the team meeting tomorrow, okay. but but all okay. of us, Kenny, myself and Elias are all gonna be down there for the majority of the day. So I don't know if any of the regular, I don't think the flex call is gonna happen. The, the uh, for Kevin, you're on the flex team, um, but I think the first flex call might happen. The 930, but it might not. So stay tuned on that. But yeah, thank you everyone for your time. Um, as always, reach out to me if there's anything I can do for you. But otherwise, I will see you on Monday. Go find an open house to do. Thank you, guys. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you coming. Appreciate it.